Um, Julie took on the very hard task of building an AF or a EP program at the VA. And she's been hard at work for the past two and a half years and uh, has come a long way in terms of uh, bringing that program to life. Uh, she's consistently been doing implants at the VA and is ready to launch an ablation program there as well. Um, most recently, Julie implanted the first cardiac contractility modulation device in our whole system at the VA. And this has come full circle to tie her back to her research days. Um, today, she's going to tell us all about that as a novel and new device therapy option for our heart failure patients. So thank you, Julie. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I think um, it's um, really apparent Dr. Akum is very excited for all programs to be an AFib program of excellence. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of AFib patients at the VA. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, cardiac contractility modulation. And it's um, the title is a new look, but maybe it should be titled as a, another look um, as CCM um, modulation therapy. Okay. Is this a BNC? It is not a BNC. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I have no disclosures. Um, and my goal today is really to introduce um, CCM therapy and to gauge um, the audience's um, interest uh, in how you think this might apply to you uh, clinically and maybe even research-wise. Uh, and the, this, these are the goals, uh, is to describe cardiac contractility modulation therapy, uh, identify the FDA-approved indication for CCM in heart failure patients, and review the basic as well as the clinical data, the early clinical data on CCM. So I think nearly everyone um, listening in can appreciate that heart failure remains a very major public health problem. This is data from the national, um, um, the NHANS Nutrition Examination Survey, as well as the um, NHLBI. Over 6 million American adults um, have heart failure um, between the years of 2013 and 2016. The estimated healthcare cost was over $30 billion in 2012. And there are over 900,000 hospital dischargers that were related to heart failure in 2014. So the um, heart failure therapies have come a long way. And this is a schematic um, looking at the evolution of therapies for heart failure, uh, beginning with the pharmacologic advances on the left side, um, including digitalis and diuretics. And then there were developments um, that are more dear to the frontline heart failure therapies, including beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, mineral corticoid receptor blockers, ARBs, um, isosorb by the hydralazine in select patients. And then there was a gap. Um, and then there we had uh, developments in ivrabidine, and more recently, the naprolysin inhibitors, and most recently, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is the uh, overview of the pharmacologic advances. From a device standpoint, um, there were a cluster of devices that came out, all kind of sequentially after the other, and they included ICD therapies, LVAD, uh, as well as cardiac resynchronization or CRT. Um, and then this is where CCM fits into um, the category. It's a newer form of device therapy for advanced heart failure, and we'll see what, what it actually is. So CCM uh, is not a pacemaker. And again, it's a novel form of device therapy for heart failure patients who are symptomatic. CCM cannot replace cardiac resynchronization, so it, it doesn't take care of CRT. The technology is new, but the implant teching is actually rather straightforward and um, somewhat easier than CRT. Again, CCM is intended to treat symptoms of heart failure. Um, so unlike an ICD, which may not necessarily, it actually doesn't make a patient feel better at all, um, a CCM is intended to do um, the opposite, which is it's to, intended to make patients feel better. The mechanism for CCM is not fully understood, but there is early data on improving quality of life and decreasing hospitalizations. And we'll look at some of this data critically. 
So what does it look like? Um, it has a pulse generator shown here on the left side. Um, so it looks like a pacemaker. It has, it uses rather commercially available active fixation leads. So any IS-1 lead. Uh, and it uses two of those leads implanted on the RV septum. So it certainly looks like a pacemaker, but again, it is not a pacemaker. And uh, we'll, we'll see why. Uh, and the other interesting thing about it is that it has a rechargeable battery. This, this device actually requires the battery to be recharged on a weekly basis. And the um, charger device is shown on the left side, excuse me, the right side of the screen. So why is it not a pacemaker? It delivers a non-excitatory high amplitude electrical impulse at the RV septum during the absolute refractory period. So because of the timing, it has no effect on the heart rhythm and it has no effect on the normal propagation of the cardiac action potential. So in panel A, um, CCM modulation is delivered um, after it senses an intrinsic QRS initiation. And then the impulse is a five to seven volt biphasic impulse delivered over 20 milliseconds during, again, the absolute refractory period of the um, cardiac contraction. And if you think about five to seven volts over 20 milliseconds, that's uh, upward, that's quite high. And that is um, nearly 300 times the impulse that you would be delivering through a standard pacemaker. What does that look like on an EKG? And that's shown in panel B. You can see the uh, limb leads and you see that there are very high pacing spikes that are at the terminal end of the QRS complex. Um, but it does not elicit any depolarization. So before we talk about why would anyone want to ever do this, um, the therapy itself is delivered not continuously, but periodically. It is delivered over five one-hour sessions throughout the day. Um, and again, the device requires recharging weekly because it delivers such a high amount of energy. Um, the recharging uh, requirement is about an hour each week, but the longevity of the battery is over 20 years. Um, and this slide was, uh, I borrowed it from Dr. Isaac Whitman, uh, who is also a former UCSF uh, electrophysiology trainee. He's currently at Temple University, and he and his colleagues have made a lot of headway in terms of implanting these devices. And so they have a small cohort there. Um, there are some misconceptions about CCM, and I just wanted to mention that CCM is actually MRI conditional. People wonder if you have a generator from one manufacturer and then different types of leads from other manufacturers, can patients still get an MRI? And the latest version of the CCM generator, the Optimizer Smart Mini, was tested with the following listed uh, pacemaker leads. And these are, again, standard pacemaker leads that are manufactured by major device companies. Uh, and combined, the system has been tested and it constitutes an MRI conditional device. So as a heart failure-based therapy, um, it was FDA approved in 2019. And before that, it was already commercially available and implanted in other countries, namely European countries. Uh, the indication um, for FDA approval was it had to be an NYHA class three or ambulatory class four patients that were symptomatic despite optimally um, tolerated to GDMT. These patients were not indicated for CRT. So either they had a narrow QRS or you could not achieve effective CRT. The LV ejection fraction of these patients um, had to be between 25 to 45%. Uh, and in the beginning, it was only applicable for patients who had sinus rhythm. That no longer is true. And now you can implant these in patients who have atrial fibrillation as well. So how does it work? And what is the mechanism behind it? Um, the mechanism, I don't think, is fully understood. But we can glean some insight from how this type of technology was even considered and, and how it ended up developing. And as early as the late 1800s, there was this um, observation made by uh, Oscar Langendorf uh, called post extrasystolic potentiation. And so he took isolated frog hearts and he measured the contractile strength of those hearts. 
And he observed that when you have a PVC, um, and then there's a compensatory pause, but then the beat following that pause has a stronger contractile force than the beat preceding the pause. Uh, and so this was reproducible, and this was a phenomenon um, called post extracellular potentiation. This is analogous to another observation uh, that's been used in the cellular and patch clamp world, uh, which is called post long clamp uh, potentiation. These are, this is an experimental technique where you voltage clamp uh, the cell or the tissue uh, to alter the duration of the cardiac action potential. Uh, and when you voltage clamp um, in, in different steps, you can either shorten the action potential duration or you can prolong the action potential duration. And following a prolonged action potential, the subsequent beat is observed to be potentiated. And so this is one of the original um, uh, recordings. So on the top, um, recordings are of depolarizing current. And um, the bottom uh, is the corresponding um, tension that's measured in the muscle fiber from an animal model. And so what you can hopefully appreciate is that when you see the current being prolonged in the top and you look at the uh, tension force of the muscle fiber, it's after a prolonged pause that you see a uh, enhancement in the contractile strength of the muscle fiber. And so this is um, post long clamp potentiation. So considering the mechanism CCM, um, in the context of excitation contraction coupling, which I hold quite dearly uh, in my heart uh, and in my memory of being a, um, a basic scientist at one point, if you think about EC coupling, you have voltage sensitive L-type calcium channels opening beginning uh, of this um, cycle and you have calcium entry into the intracellular space. And then that stimulates calcium induced calcium release from the ryanidine receptors that calcium is allowed to bind to troponin C, and that uh, is what stimulates myocardial contraction. Um, the calcium handling is reshuffled uh, because calcium has to be um, taken away from the intracellular space in order for this to start again. And that reshuffling involves circa, which reuptakes calcium back into the sarcoplasm, sarcoplasm reticulum. That activity is then um, um, regulated by phospholambin and its phosphorylation and is also regulated by NCX. Now, if you imagine this process of calcium handling within the cell, but there were no myocardial contraction, what do you think the outcome would be? Um, so again, if you had L-type calcium channels, and I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, um, but if you have L-type calcium channels that start by increasing intracellular calcium influx, and that causes calcium-induced calcium release through the SR. Um, but let's suppose you don't have um, contraction because the, the contraction is already taking place. The calcium still has to get recycled uh, and reuptaken by circa. Um, and so if this keeps going without myocardial contraction because if the cell were already committed to contraction, the outcome would be that you have increased calcium stores within the sarcoplasm reticulum. It's almost akin to preparing for battle without actually deploying your troops. And so that kind of analogy is, I think, the most simplistic way I can give for the proposed mechanism how, for how this might work. Um, because if you had an enhanced accumulation of calcium within your calcium stores, then what happens is on the subsequent beat, there is more calcium that can be released and therefore the cardiac contractility or the contraction of the next um, beat will be enhanced. There is also other um, phenomenon that's been proposed for this mechanism in addition to calcium handling, and that involves changing the gene expression of the tissue, both at the site where the stimulation is occurring as well as remotely. Um, and combined, um, this has been proposed to, to be the mechanism or how it can help with um, global adverse remodeling in the heart failure patients. So what is the data to kind of support this proposed um, model? Okay, so these are um, some experiments that were done in an animal model, muscle fiber, 
Um, so electric currents were applied to isolated cardiac muscle, again, during the absolute refractory period. And CCM, when it's delivered in the top panel, panel A, it increases the contractile force, which is measured on the y-axis. And that's illustrated in the gray lines. In the presence of ryanidine, that, um, that type of CCM-induced contractility is blunted, and, and that's depicted in the red lines. They also tested verapamil to block L-type calcium channel, um, and that was also um, blunting for the CCM-induced contractility. So that implicates calcium handling somewhere in, in the effect that CCM has on the cell. What they also observed in panel B is that if you were to apply CCM intermittently, that the enhancement on contractility occurs on the subsequent beat. Um, so that's illustrated, again, highlighted here. And that, again, is akin to the um, experimental phenomenon that was seen earlier with post-long clamp um, potentiation with uh, voltage clamping. So in another animal model uh, for CCM, in, the, in this case, a canine model of heart failure, um, uh, uh, experimental um, results have shown that there are acute effects of CCM, uh, namely involving the phosphorylation of phospholambin. And so phosphorylate phospholambin is known to disinhibit circa. And that allows for increased calcium reuptake to the sarcoplasm reticulum. Uh, it is also known that in heart failure models, heart failure tissue, that there is less phosphorylation of phospholambin. Uh, and when um, these heart failure models, in this model in particular, when they're given CCM therapy, phosphorylation of phospholambin can be rescued within two hours of therapy. This effect, this acute effect at least, is limited to the site where the CCM stimulus is being delivered. And at a remote location where the CCM stimulus is not delivered, uh, they, don't, they did not observe that, that um, reversal of phospholate phospholambin. What happens chronically uh, after, after three months of CCM therapy in, in the same canine model? And what the, um, um, what the observations were uh, are that CCM can increase expression, protein expression of circa 2 a phospholambin and the ryanidine receptor compared to um, sham. And it, it actually rescues uh, the heart failure state back to a normal state, both at the interventricular septum where the stimulus for CCM is being delivered, as well as in the left ventricular free wall, which is remote from the site of CCM delivery. And long-term wise, the phosphorylation of phospholambin also increases with CCM, both at the site of stimulation, as well as remote from the site of stimulation, uh, restoring it back to the normal state compared to, to the sham control. So again, these are experiments that were done in animal models. What happens, um, oh, before I get to the human studies, uh, they also look at cardiac function in the canine model. And they saw by echocardiographic parameters that there is a slight decrease in um, the LV size. Uh, and there's also an improvement in LV ejection fraction in the pre versus the post CCM treatment um, compared to the sham control. So what about the data in, in humans? Um, so this is looking at endomyocardial biopsies from patients that were treated with 12 weeks of CCM therapy programmed on, followed by 12 weeks that was programmed off, and that's group one, um, and vice versa. So 12 weeks of CCM programmed off, followed by 12 weeks being on, then that's listed in group two. That data is listed in group two. And what they looked at were um, gene expression. Uh, in, in these panels is looking at alpha MHC. Um, we all know that beta MHC is um, a, a trigger for fetal reprogramming and is a hallmark for adverse remodeling in heart failure. And so what they observed was that with CCM therapy, that it can actually increase the expression of alpha MHC and, and restore the adult phenotype. And so that is true when CCM is on in both groups one and group two, and it doesn't seem to matter the, the, uh, with respect to the, to the um, sequence. And when you combine the data all together, uh, when the CCM therapy is on, that leads to an increase in alpha HMC expression compared to the period, the period when the treatment is off. They looked at additional genes um, and the expression of those genes in this model. 
And CCM um, can up or down regulate a number of different genes, um, including AMP, BMP, phospholambin, uh, NCX, and ryanidine receptor. So it is doing something uh, long-term uh, in, um, in these hearts. So this is a, a schematic from um, the company, the only company that manufactures CCM right now. Uh, looking at what is an overview for the kind of progressive changes that one would expect with CCM therapy. So during the rapid phase, within hours to um, minutes to hours, there is a uh, immediate phosphorylation of key proteins involved in calcium handling. And um, very importantly, they did experiments to, to suggest that there is no increased intracardio, excuse me, no increased myocardio oxygen consumption from using CCM therapy. And they, so they measured um, the, the blood samples um, from these patients and demonstrated that there was no uh, increased usage of myocardial O2. And subsequently, over time, you would expect to see long-term effects of CCM, um, including the shifting of the gene program from a heart failure um, phenotype to a more normal um, baseline phenotype. Uh, and then um, eventually, um, within weeks to months is when you would expect to see the ventricular properties and, and hopefully the, the function of the heart improve. Um, and I think um, the, one of the, the biggest caveats of this technology is that there's not enough long-term outcomes data. Uh, and that is something that I think we um, are, people who are following this story are, are much in anticipation of. So, Again, the concerns for CCM being a novel device therapy for heart failure patients is that there is no long-term data or hard core outcomes such as survival. There's yet to be large double-blinded randomized clinical trials. Um, and because many of the studies were not blinded, um, there may be a placebo effect. Some other concerns people have raised about this therapy is that you have too much hardware uh, in the chest. And these patients usually have an indication for an ICD or maybe eventually they might need a pacemaker for pacing. Uh, and there becomes, it becomes very crowded. And that has implications for device infection, lead extraction, et cetera. Um, some people voiced earlier that CCM is not MRI conditional. And I mentioned earlier, that's not true. CCM now is MRI conditional. Uh, and then lastly, the proposed mechanisms, um, although there, there are proposed mechanisms, they're somewhat limited. And they're not necessarily intuitive, unlike CRT. So, I kind of wanted to phrase, um, or excuse me, I kind of wanted to frame CCM development uh, in the context of how CRT was launched, because it's, it's a bit interesting to me how CRT was adopted, how quickly it was adopted back in the early 2000s. Uh, I think we have um, the advantage of hindsight now. You have two decades, over two decades of data on CRT and the, and the benefits, but 20 years ago, we didn't have that data. And so it's curious to me how CRT was adopted back in the days when the data wasn't as robust. And so let's take a moment to uh, revisit that. So CRT um, was, or the mechanism of CRT was studied a long time ago, um, but it was not as molecular and certainly not as granular uh, as the tools that are available nowadays. But clinically it was studied since 1998. And the first um, CRT system was FDA approved in 2001. Uh, and then between 2001 and 2004, the FDA extended the approval uh, to over two dozen CRT models from three different manufacturers. And that seems pretty amazing, that, that um, uh, acceleration of um, making CRT being available. And since then, the CRT market has grown, and, and now it has um, a market share of over $4 billion in, in 2022 in the United States alone. So what happened? Um, so this is actually a, a publication from Dr. Arun Sridhar looking at the implanting patterns, the early implanting patterns of CRT uh, since it was approved in, in 2001. And so I wanted to focus on the initial years between 2002, 2003, and 2004. And you can see that between 2002 and 2003, there is a, um, a sudden rise in the number of implants or CRT it increased from 2,700 to 27,000 within a year. And if you take it into the context of the, the available data at the time, MUSTIC and Miracle uh, and Miracle ICD were really the only trials that had um, published data by 2003. Companion came out in 2004, 
CARE-HF came out in 2005. So the pivotal trials looking at the mortality benefit for CRT did not happen until after more people started implanting CRT. So I kind of, kind of wonder why that is. And I asked the audience to think about that and think back in the day when CRT was initially introduced, what was the catalyst for it? And why was there such an enthusiasm among providers to refer patients to EP? And why there was such an enthusiasm among EP doctors to implant these? So again, looking at the earlier clinical studies on CRT, um, between um, the years, um, these were when they were started in 1998 and up until 2002, there was the Medtronic InSync and InSync ICD, and then there was the Guidan Contact ICD. And these were small studies, uh, and the primary effective endpoints were on the functional class, on six minute walk test, and on quality of life questionnaires. Um, contact um, CD actually looked at the composite index of mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. Uh, but they actually did not um, meet that primary effectiveness endpoint. So again, looking at um, the earlier data, there was a suggestion that CRT can reduce hospitalizations for heart failure from Mustic and Miracle. Um, but when you look at the, the data sets that they, it was available, it was still in a small number of patients. So for Mustic, it was under 100. And for Miracle, it was under, under 500. But nonetheless, this was the data that was available. And this was, as far as I can tell, what uh, CRT was launched off of. But CRT is not for every heart failure patient, as, as we can appreciate. The majority of heart failure patients are actually not CRT candidates because they, have, um, uh, they don't have a YQRS or they have no pacing indication. Uh, and 30% of CRT patients um, can be found to be non-responders, although that does include, a, I think, a significant proportion of patients who are not optimized on CRT because it's challenging to optimize patients on CRT. Uh, it makes the clinic appointments longer. You have to be changing parameters on the device concurrently with running ECGs. And, and so it can be time consuming. Um, and if you look at the patients who are not candidates for CRT, and if you look at all heart failure patients in total, as high as 30 to 40 percent um, are in an IHA class three or ambulatory class four. So there's a lot of patients that um, are symptomatic and who are not CRT candidates that could potentially benefit from a device therapy like CCM. So then now let's look at the CCM clinical studies that led to FDA approval. Um, these were studies that were done um, in the early parts of 2000s and, and later on in 2014. The first study was FIX HF5 phase one. That was a pilot study that was to establish safety. Um, and that was a study that also looked at NYH class three um, as uh, the endpoint, as well as um, the uh, quality of life questionnaire and then the six minute walk test and uh, peak VO2 max. Um, this was followed by the phase two trial um, that unfortunately did not meet the primary endpoint. So then it was followed by the fixed HF5C uh, confirmatory trial that specifically measured again peak VO2, and that did meet the primary endpoint. So let's look at that data. So the main findings for fixed HF5C was, was a difference in peak VO2 um, uh, of uh, 0.84 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute, and that satisfied the primary endpoint. And you may look at that and say, oh, that's a pretty small marginal difference. Um, it's actually comparable to the, again, the earlier data on CRT of what was reported from those trials. When they looked at the Minnesota living with heart failure questionnaire, so a quality of life um, questionnaire, and they looked at NYHA functional class, as well as a six minute hall walk, these were all shown to be improving with the treatment group of CCM compared to the control group. Um, one of the criticisms of this study and uh, two of the studies preceding that is that it was not a blinded study because it was CCM um, randomized to um, versus optimal medical therapy. They also looked at the composite of cardiac death and hospital um, heart failure hospitalizations, and they saw that uh, the estimated event proportions were reduced in the CCM treatment group compared with the control group, again, con control being optimal medical therapy. So there are a number of caveats um, from this early clinical data. Um, things as listed here include the observed treatment difference for peak VO2 was small, 
And some of that difference may be due to a decline from the baseline in the control arm. Uh, the studies were unblinded uh, for the most part. And so that raises the question of the placebo effect. Although there was a lot of care taken to try to minimize that um, by having patients perform um, uh, rigorous cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, they had to perform cardiopulmonary exercise testing on two different days uh, to um, make sure that there was maximum effort and reading the test results was blinded. And um, the other caveat, of course, is again, there's limited long-term data uh, on, the, on the outcomes. Uh, although I just showed that there's a composite cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization that was estimated to be decreased. And comparing the effects of CCM and CRT, this is looking at um, pooling this data together and the effects on peak VO2 on the left and then the um, quality of life questionnaire in the middle, six minute walk test, uh, and then the improvement in N1, NYHA classification. You can see comparing CCM, um, which are in the uh, green and the orange bars uh, versus CRT, it's um, comparable, if not comparable, it's actually even better depending on the ejection fraction of the patients that are being studied. So, and I think the takeaway that I want to, to give is that even though the data doesn't seem robust, it's comparable again to what was um, in the early, phase, early days of CRT. And the question remains still is why did CRT launch with that data that we had back in, in 2003? So there is some long-term data uh, on CCM, but this is all part of prospective registry data, uh, initially published in 2019 um, for 140 patients, and then later uh, updated in 2021 to over 500 patients. And what they saw was that um, in tracking survival over a three-year period, the primary endpoint was uh, death from all causes, and they compared it because there was no control. Uh, they compared it, um, their control was the prediction of um, events um, by the Seattle heart model, uh, heart failure model. And they saw that in all patients, there was a trend towards um, the, a decrease in the probability of survival. Uh, when you looked at it by, by the, the groups of um, LV ejection fraction between 25 to 34%, there was no difference. But if you looked at it at um, between 35 and 45%, it was statistically significant. Um, when you look at the data over three years for the 500 patients, um, looking at the observed survival and comparing it to another risk model for adverse events, the MAGIC risk score, which is in, in the dotted lines here, um, compared for the entire cohort, there was a, a, um, a benefit um, for um, um, improving survival with CCM, but that was not true um, for patients who had an LV ejection fraction of less than 25%. So that seems to suggest that you know, if for patients with really severe heart failure, that maybe the remodeling is, is, is really irreversible in that context. Um, they looked at um, other metrics, including NYHA class and quality of life, uh, as well as LV ejection fraction over time. And they found that um, with CCM compared um, to baseline, there is an improvement in those metrics sustained over a 24 uh, month follow period. Uh, when they subdivided that data to look at patients um, who had a lower ejection fraction, less than 25%, uh, versus 26 to 34%, versus a greater than 35%, um, what they saw was that, um, interestingly, in patients who had the lowest ejection fraction, they were the ones who had a higher um, uh, increase in, in LVEF with CCM therapy, kind of contrary to what the survival data has suggested. And finally, when they look at um, subgroups of patients, depending on their atrial rhythm, whether were, they were in the normal sinus rhythm or whether they were in atrial fibrillation, they found no difference. So CCM, it can be applicable for patients who have atrial fibrillation as well. Um, looking at cardiovascular uh, hospitalizations, um, both cardiovascular hospitalizations that were heart failure related and non heart failure and non heart failure related, what they saw was that in all patients um, in the time period after CCM was implanted, compared to the one year before CCM was implanted, there was a reduction in, in cardiovascular hospitalizations. Uh, and that was true for um, um, all the subgroups of LVEF they looked at. So uh, we do have an initial experience with CCM um, at the Seattle VA. If you're interested in, in CCM and wondering if it can apply to maybe a few of your patients, 
Um, it's not yet available uh, at UW, um, but it is on the national contract with the VA. So we had our first implant uh, and that was the first time when I was implanted for all of Seattle. And this was a patient who was, um, who was 69 years old, uh, has severe ischemic cardio cardiomyopathy with an EF of 25 to 30%, had a narrowish QRS duration of 122 milliseconds. Uh, he was referred for primary prevention ICD. He had um, significant symptoms of heart failure, NYHA class three, uh, mostly exertional dyspnea and fatigue. The implanting procedure, as I said, is, is relatively straightforward. Um, I don't know if this plays for you, it does, great. Um, it involves, again, um, having two septal leads that are implanted in the RV septum. And uh, Dr. Creighton Don assisted with this case um, and showed with ice where the leads were placed. So the very bright um, object is the defibrillator lead. And then there are two leads that are coming into view along the RV septum. If you were to clock this ice um, more, you would um, see the left ventricle. On, um, on fluoroscopy, uh, what you can see from RAO to now LAO, um, this was the lead position. So the ICD lead is more apical um, and is recommended that it would be um, three to uh, two to three centimeters away from the CCM leads. And the two CCM leads are on the septum and they're typically recommended to be spaced two centimeters apart. So the implant technique, again, is, is simpler compared to a CRT implant. Um, and the end result um, in, on chest x-ray, this is what it looks like. The ICD device is on the left and the CCM device is on, on the right. And on the lateral chest x-ray, you can see that um, these are the final lead positions. So here is the proposed algorithm for CCM patient selection. For those who are interested and, and are thinking that you may have a patient who might benefit from this, uh, consider the patient who has symptomatic heart failure with NYHA class three or ambulatory class four, and they're already on opt optimal medical therapy. Um, if the patient has AFib and they don't need pacing um, and their EF is 25 to 45%, um, you can consider CCM. If they have sinus rhythm, but they have a narrowish, narrowish QRS that's less than 130 milliseconds, you can still consider CCM with or without an ICD, depending on their ejection fraction. So it's, I think, a rather simple way of looking at this. And then to just to reiterate the patient selection, um, again, is NYHA class three or ambulatory class four heart failure patients who are symptomatic despite uh, GDMT, an EF of 25 to 45% who are the very key here is not a candidate for CRT. And I think it's really important in speaking with these patients who are symptomatic to engage in shared decision-making, um, to um, explain to them that there is no long-term data on outcomes, but there is a chance um, that this may make them feel better, unlike an ICD, which has a survival benefit um, that's very well known, but it does nothing for the symptoms of heart failure. So um, I'd like to involve the audience and see if you can participate in this poll. And after what was presented and, and maybe your own knowledge about what you've heard about CCM, uh, will you consider CCM for your patients? Um, yes, no, or maybe you're not sure and you want to wait for more information. I don't think, um, I'm not quite sure to see how many respond with this poll, but we can see if the numbers continue to change or not. Okay. Um, yeah, so 50% um, of those who responded um, said yes, that you would consider it. 25% um, said no, and then um, actually more than that says I'm not sure. Okay, good. For those who um, um, said no, and for those who said I'm, I'm not sure, 
um, what is what is a concern or reservation you might have? Would it be that there's again not enough long-term data? Uh, there is a potential placebo effect. Uh, there's too much hardware, uh, as we've shown. There's an unclear mechanism of action. You don't think that the basic science is is there where it needs to be. Um, worry that insurance may not cover it or other. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, um, responses for not enough long-term data. And that is a definitely fair point. Um, and so again, I, I kind of wonder, and I wasn't um, practicing in the days when CRT launched, but comparing, as far as I can tell, the difference between the, the CRT era and this current era, um, to me at least, it seems like there wasn't as much robust data about CRT back in 2002 and 2003. So it remains a curiosity to me why CRT, there was so much enthusiasm for CRT back in those days. And if anyone in the audience can chime in on that, I would, I would love to discuss it both here and, and maybe later. Um, and so the final one is, if you have any other concerns or factors that I did not address in the talk, um, please share it with me. And this is a free response for anyone who's interested in responding. cost. So the, the cost for a CCM device, um, so there is actually a CPT code for CCM. Um, you do have to, uh, I think the advantage of working within the VA system is um, this, if, if we feel that it is indicated for the patient, we can offer it to our patients. Um, from an insurance standpoint, I think most major insurance companies consider this to be an investigational device. So you do have to get um, pre pre approval for it. Uh, the reimbursement, though, is very comparable again to the early days of CRT. The device itself, um, uh, at least um, depending on various different hospital contracts, is between twenty to thirty thousand. Uh, and and that as a novel device therapy again is comparable to um, a CRT device. Battery life. That's interesting. Yeah, it has a 20 year battery life, um, at which point it does need to be changed. It does have to be recharged on a weekly basis. And I wonder if that was a concern. Um, you know, relying on patients to recharge a battery, you know, some people can get a little nervous about that. I think the analogy um, to, to think in that context is that we rely on our patients to be medically compliant too. And they have to take their heart failure medications in order for them to be effective. Um, the difference between this device and something like a pacemaker or an ICD is that it is not life-threatening immediately to the patient if they do not charge their CCM device. If they don't charge their CCM device, um, what the result would be is that they may not feel as well if they had a benefit from CCM therapy, but it wouldn't be life-threatening. So um, in, in that context, um, I would think of it, or the way I think of it is that I compare it to relying on the patient to take their, their daily medications. Yeah, so the way they charge it is that um, there is a charger that they put over their generator and they wait for an hour. So at that point, um, I mean, they can watch television, or they can read a book, um, and they just wait for it to be charged. So it is wireless charging. Yes. And here's a great question. How are you monitoring patients' improved symptoms? That is a great question. Um, so right now, it's based on a kind of a subjective measurement um, based on their, their quality of life questionnaire. So um, I started doing that for uh, the heart failure patients refer to me. Uh, and also for, um, in terms of objective measurement, we can look at cardiopulmonary stress testing, and we'll certainly look at um, their LV function. And then 
I don't think that early CRT data were randomized is particularly important in device trials. Also, the long-term risk of the tricuspid valve function is concerning. Yes. Um, so, so this gets to the point there being a lot of hardware, uh, especially across the tricuspid valve. Uh, I think there's different uh, perspectives on that. And for me personally, um, this device, the CCM device, is um, uh, has been tested with the, the Medtronic um, lead that is the, the smaller lead, the four French lead, which was initially developed for pediatric patients. So two of those leads, plus or minus an ICD lead, um, even though, again, we don't have long-term data on the effects of um, tricuspid valve function. In general, when we think about um, tricuspid valve function with standard pacemaker leads or defibrillator leads, um, it really hasn't panned out the, the direct relationship to, to um, TR, tricuspid regurgitation, nor has it panned out what it means if we were to remove the leads. Does that improve tricuspid regurgitation? Um, and so I think um, there remains, that remains to be seen. And can you get more detail on clinical trials? Was there a positive control? How blinded were the subjects? Did all subjects get a device? Yes. So no, not all subjects got a device. Most of the trials were not blinded. And so they were randomized to CCM versus optimal medical therapy. And the positive control, um, they were not compared to CRT directly, if we think of CRT as the gold standard. And again, this is for patients who are not indicated for CRT. So you wouldn't be implanting CRT in these patients anyway. How does CCM address frequent PVCs? It doesn't. Um, it senses, there's two leads, and so it can sense an intrinsic beat, and if it senses a PVC, it will not stimulate. And what about a leadless CCM? We're not quite there yet. Those are all great. Um, great concerns and great things that people have brought up. Thank you, thank you for that. And if anyone has anything additional to say, please um, feel free to reach out to me. I wanna end um, with a review of the key points and also looking at some potential research opportunities for CCM. Um, again, CCM is a novel device therapy for heart failure patients. It is not a pacemaker. It looks like a pacemaker, but it is not a pacemaker. Uh, it delivers a non-excitatory stimulation during the absolute refractory period. It is not prorhythmic and it cannot replace CRT. It is currently indicated for patients with NYHA class three or ambulatory class four who are symptomatic with an EF of 25 to 45% and a narrow QRS. The technology is new, but again, the implant technique is straightforward and easier compared to CRT. CCM is intended to treat symptoms of heart failure. So there is the potential that it will make your patients feel better and improve their quality of life. And uh, although the mechanism is not fully understood and there remains to be seen, it remains to be seen what the long-term outcomes are, there is early data on improving quality of life and decreasing hospitalizations. So there are two uh, industry-sponsored trials right now that are uh, ongoing, um, and one of which just started. Um, this is the Integrity. This device uh, combines CCM therapy with a defibrillator into one generator. So for those who are concerned about additional hardware, this can be a game changer. Um, this trial is a safety and efficacy trial. The protocol was just FDA approved in March. Um, and the study design is gonna involve 300 subjects, a prospective single arm multi-center trial with a two year follow-up. The first implant was already done in the Cleveland Clinic and it was um, presented at the Heart Rhythm Society meeting two weeks ago. The primary efficacy endpoints include defibrillation efficacy at the time of implant, uh, with acute DE testing performed on the first 100 to 127 patients. The inclusion criteria are that they have to be adults, they have to have an EF less than 40%, they have to have stage C or D heart failure on GDMT, and they have to have an indication for an ICD. And so um, this is the schematic um, looking on the right of the patients who have heart failure, um, and even including those who have preserved heart failure. And there's a separate study that is ongoing and sponsored by the, the, the uh, manufacturer of CCM, and that's called AIM Higher. This is looking at the assessment of implantable CCM in patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The basis for this is that um, the observed enhancement for CCM seemed to be more robust in patients who had an LVEF of over 35%. 
And so that formed the basis for the study. And also, I think a lot of the, the um, motivation behind it is that there's very limited therapies that we have for patients who are symptomatic with diastolic heart failure. And so this study will be a randomized blinded sham control study um, looking at the safety and effectiveness of CCM therapy in patients with symptomatic heart failure, but their EFs are greater than 40%. Uh, is going to involve um, a larger number of patients, 1,500 randomized in a two-to-one fashion to either CCM on or CCM off. So this one will have a sham. The primary efficacy will be looking at six-minute walk distance, um, the quality of life um, questionnaires, uh, a composite of cardiovascular death, heart failure, hospitalizations, and any urgent heart failure visits that require IV therapy. Uh, and then the inclusion criteria list is so symptomatic heart failure, again, the EF of greater than 40%, heart failure hospitalization within 12 months prior to the study, consent uh, is also inclusion criteria, uh, elevated BNP, and they have to be stable uh, on a stable regimen of a loop diuretic. Um, so these are research opportunities that are available. Um, and um, as an institution in the VA, we are trying to participate in, in at least one of them, the integrity study. So with that, I want to thank everyone um, whom I talked to about the study. I want to thank Nazem um, for introducing me and for the audience for attending and listening into this conversation. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, go ahead, please, Farid, and then Janonza. Yeah, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm a big fan of contractility, obviously. So my um, question was, but is about the HFS uh, trial. What would be the mechanism? I, I, I'm. It, it doesn't. It's not too intuitive to me. Just because there's no therapy doesn't mean that we should do stuff to patients. I. I don't understand what the mechanism is. Yeah, the um, the motivation behind that is in their subgroup analysis from the Fix Five C study. They saw the the best benefit for CCM, CCM to be in patients who had a higher EF compared with a lower EF. And that's the motivation, but the mechanism is not has not been even studied. Or I mean, those are still systolic heart failure patients, right? It's they on are the higher end. So I, yeah, exactly. yeah. I, that's a fair point. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, thanks for teaching us about this system. You know, I imagine when they were uh, thinking of this concept that they had to think hard about the current drainage on the battery and how to make it last. If uh, CCM were to have wider adoption, do you think there's potential that it could spur more innovation and competition in, in, in pacemaker batteries to make them last longer, for example, which would make them more accessible in places with lower resources? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I've been following the story um, back in the days when I was um, studying excitation contraction coupling, and I always thought that this technology would have been absorbed already by another major device manufacturer. So the fact that it hasn't is sometimes um, can be thought of as a concern for some people. Uh, but at the same time, I wonder, you know, about there probably are different market forces that are not understandable by me that um, are dictating where this direction is going. But you would think that, yeah, naturally it should extend into other devices that if we have the technology to recharge, why not recharge? I do think there's a safety element to it. For a patient who has a pacemaker, who's dependent on pacing or who has an ICD uh, with an indication for ICD, relying on them to recharge the battery may be a, a leap um, for our current, from our current standard of practice. And so I think that may be a, a player in that decision-making. Yes. Yeah, so, well, thanks for a very well-organized and clear talk. I had never heard about this device, so I, I, I learned a lot. I'm curious as to what the ideas are for why the patients feel better. And you know, the, the very small in increment in LVEF is probably unlikely to explain that. Um, do they have lower pulmonary artery systolic pressures? Do they have lower BNPs? And have, were those endpoints examined in... Um, the, the CRT trials, I, I wonder, because it's sort of a mystery as to, to me as to why they would feel better. Yeah, no, I think that's um, also a fair point. I, I, I think of this um, twofold. So the first part of your question is, 
the uh, perceived effect seems to be disproportionate to the objective effect. Um, the, there is limited data on the objective effect, first of all, and the improvement in peak VO2 is small, but again, it's comparable to CRT. So uh, I still want to draw the parallel in CRT, and I asked, why do CRT patients feel better if the effect in peak VO2 you know, is a small increase? And if you look at the um, um, improvement in LV function in patients with CRT, on average, you know, it's still not, it's still not anywhere above five to ten percent, I would say. But nonetheless, those patients still report improvement in their quality of life, and they still have better functional capacity. So, what is the threshold that you need you know, to improve on certain parameters before you have a, an appreciable quality of life difference? I think that probably is the question, and I don't think that anyone really knows. But BMP is something that um, not in the earlier studies, but in the later studies, they will be measuring as part of the study design, as was mentioned. Seems like you've generated a lot of interest, uh, Julie. We're quickly running out of time, so maybe we can answer one or maximum two more questions. One came through the chat is on um, the actual therapy delivery. So what's the rationale behind the, the secret sauce, like turning it on and turning it off? And has there been any thresholding or uh, trials on different ways of delivering it? Yeah, I don't think clinically that there has been. Um, certainly on the research um, uh, in the animal models, they have tested different um, durations of therapy and, and how long it's been delivered. Uh, I, I think, and this is kind of um, um, being uh, speculative about the mechanism, again, of how this is working. If you were to have an enhancement in calcium handling in the cell, it has to be up to a certain extent, because otherwise you'll be flooding, flooding the cell intracellular space with calcium. And if you have um, increase in intracellular calcium, uh, as was observed in some of this data, there's increase in phosphorylation for phospholambin so that the cell reuptakes calcium into the sarcoplasm reticulum. And there's also reversal of NCX um, current. And to me, that seems like these are compensatory mechanisms that the cell has to try to deal with this excess calcium in the intracellular space. So, um, you know, I. I don't know what the, how rigorous different um, um, programming um, sequences were tested for, for this type of therapy, but I do think there is a limit to, it, to every type of therapy that you don't want to overdo it. Do you change the programming based on a certain threshold, whether there's an ischemic component to the heart failure or not? Um, has there been any studies looking at the effect on left ventricle versus right. David mentioned intracardiac and pulmonary pressures. Yeah, no, there hasn't been. There is, this is why I think it's a great opportunity for anybody interested in research um, because it hasn't been studied with that degree of, of rigor. Uh, and I also think that um, when you look at the um, function of the heart um, with CCM, um, what you're referring to, um, if it... Um, um, affects the right ventricle more or less so than the left ventricle. This brings up the question long-term wise, why is the effect um, not just at the site where the stimulation is taking place, but also on the cellular and gene expression level it is taking place remotely. Um, no one really quite understands the mechanism. They propose that it relates to the way that calcium is being handled across cell membranes um, in involving gap junctions. But again, there's a lot of hand waving. So I think this is a, a very open market and there's a lot of opportunities for both clinicians and researchers who are interested. Do you, you think it's so they just haven't published that because a huge amount of that data is already available if they did an echo on these patients? Uh, a huge amount of echo on... The cellular pressure, the RV function, all that stuff should be there. Do you think there's just a publication lag at this point? Potentially, yeah. I, I haven't seen that data. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine they just did an echo looking at the ejection fraction. Right, right. Uh, well, it, this is a, the, yeah, but this pertains to how rigorous they looked at their data. I'm sure that data is probably out there, as, as you say. Well, thanks again, Julie. Exciting times in EP. Yes, very exciting. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you.